Welcome to Heart Speak Podcast, episode 182, Speaking with Our Ancestors. Well, hello there. Wherever you are in the world, I am in England. It's so good to be back here. And especially at this time of year when there are so many daffodils and crocuses and blossoms. I saw a beautiful magnolia tree. This is certainly a time of spring and we're having good weather. And I'm taking you on a bit of a travel log with me because I came here to see friends and family and to visit several of the sacred sites that I find so enriching and empowering for me. And maybe I just felt that despite everything that's happening in the world, I needed to come back to some of the ancient teachings, the wisdoms, and especially connecting with people, stones, plants, that have been here much longer than I have on this earth at this time and have been through many times of turmoil and wars and changes and have survived. It feels that remembering this power of the earth to go through these cycles is really important. So I arrived here on the equinox. We have equal day, equal night around the world and decided that we would with my friend, visit what is Runnymede or Ankawik, the, the yew tree that was so sacred to the Druids. And it's believed that it was here on an island that originally was surrounded by the River Thames that the Magna Carta was signed over 800 years ago. And it feels symbolic that the Magna Carta for Britain was really the constitution of Britain and it came about because the king at that time was not strong enough and the tribes or the different groups said we need to have a constitution we can't just rely on you making the plans and they all came together eventually to sign this treaty and and this seems to be so symbolic for now we can't have one person or one group deciding what's right for the community or what's right for all. This seems to be a time for honesty, for integrity, for accountability, and to come together again, not just for individual countries, but nor also for a one world government, but more in humanity. Humanity in its diversity, not in its, not its unification, where we all have to be the same. And so I went there with this idea of how was that 800 years ago to be having that time where perhaps the king was being forced to sign this, but really saying we can't go on in this with these tribal wars, we can't go on um, creating poverty with one group because there's another war needing to happen and we're going to steal all the money. Now, that continued to happen, I have to say, for, for hundreds of years and probably is still happening now. But the fact of the matter is I went there because this idea of the equinox being such a powerful time, a, a portal into a new world, a new way of being, felt really important to go there. And with my friend, we went out and we walked along the beautiful meadows by the side of the Thames. And there's been a lot of rain in Britain and certainly the, the Thames is running very high, but the daffodils were there and the blossoms were there, a few snowdrops. And it felt as if the land was reclaiming itself in many ways, beautiful willow trees. And as we came to the yew tree, I realized how much the yew trees had meant to Britain and the world, in fact. And I understand that you could go back almost 140 million years and find not particularly a yew tree, but something was that was its ancestor all that time back. And yew trees are said to be able to survive for thousands of years. Some have been seen to survive for 4,500 years. And they, they have this ability to create a new trunk by the branches laying on the ground. So as soon as a branch, this rather heavy branch lays on the ground, there is this regenerative cycle. And so they're seen for their 
birth and death or the regeneration after death. So many of them are found within churches or churchyards here, I should say, in Britain and around the world. And the Druids who were the ancient people uh, connected to the Celts were, were very much the Druid tradition, often would surround a church with or a temple or a sacred place with yew trees, that idea of regeneration. And that really was the reason they were often found in churches, the idea of sometimes people would bury their loved ones with a yew branch, hoping for that regeneration. Interestingly, yew trees in their own right are poisonous, and almost every part of it is poisonous. And therefore yews, yew trees and yew bushes were often used to keep animals in a in a certain place without the need for fencing because the animals knew not to eat the yew tree for its own uh, because of its poisonous abilities therefore it was a good way of fencing something in it has been used some of the extract from it has been used as an anti-cancer property uh, and fairly successfully but that's in more recent times but the idea that you've got something that is about death and rebirth that is actually quite poisonous to humans and to animals is a kind of an oxymoron here because uh, you would feel that there's something very life-giving. But I think that when I went to see this beautiful tree, and it is a magnificent one, and there are images here, you'll understand that there's something so ancient about these trees. And I can believe that this was a place where the Druids saw uh, great sacredness and would honour the fact that something that was going to be created for prosperity, for, for generations to come, should be something that symbolises death and rebirth, regeneration. And I think that's what we all need at this time, this idea of something very important that will continue on. Just another little tidbit here that this particular yew tree was said to have been one where Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn would court while he was married to someone else. I'm not sure that actually did her any favours, but there we go. So this was my first introduction into Britain again, and my honouring of the equinox, and, and, the, and being with these trees that said things will go on, something will continue, and to trust that process. But sometimes we have to die to the old for something new to be born. Following my enjoyable day at the yew tree, the following day we, my friend and I went down to Avebury. I love Avebury, it's the, the largest stone circle and stone complex in Britain, much larger than Stonehenge, and probably built even before that time. But when we go to the Avebury area, there are many different constructs that I want to share with you. First one I'm going to share with you is Silbury Hill. Silbury Hill is a man-made mound, a sacred mound, sacred mountain. And it sits quite low down uh, compared with the Avebury Stone Circle. But it, with the Avebury Stone Circle and other constructs that I'm going to talk about, it sits on a very unusual magnetic anomaly or where the chalk layers underneath these constructs uh, create some what we call uh, discontinuity of the magnetic fields. It acts somewhat by creating this area as if it's a peninsula, it holds the energy into this place. And somehow the ancient people of 4,000 years ago knew about this. So they understood that because of the chalk, not only was this creating a very strong magnetic field, but also because water runs beneath that chalk and gets absorbed uh, into the chalk, that you also intensify this magnetic field. So it was understood that there were certain times of the year when the water was running high, that this magnetic field would be very powerful. 
And hence, they, they, people created this amazing mound, which is 130 feet high. And it's made up of chalk and soil and gravel and flint and many layered. And it's at an angle, which is the, one could say the maximum angle that you can achieve. I think it's around 52 degrees and it's flat on the top. There have been attempts to send a shaft into the top to see what was in there. And of course they found some burials, but that doesn't seem any to have any relevance to what really was going on. And what's really important is that ar around this mound are six concentric circles. So they were very specific about almost terracing or creating this mound with these circles. And what we understand where you have those concentric circles, the energy is builds up over the time. So what do people think that Silbury was about? I should mention there was a ditch around it. And in those times, the River Kennet would be much higher and the area would be flooded around Silbury Hill. So again, increasing the conductivity of this, this electrical force within this magnetic electrical force. Uh, that was contained within the mound itself. So people see it as an energy store, uh, not just a generator, but more of a store of energy that then feeds in to the structures around Avebury. Some see it as a pregnant woman, and certainly it looks like that. It's, it's very much honoured by the feminine, and I could see that, and people talk about how Avebury itself, for the whole area, is in honour of the different phases of the goddess. So the fertility, the death phase, but this silvery hill with the big, what we might say, pregnant belly is definitely this nurturing, this power place. And it feels as if Silbury Hill was created at a time, and this is just uh, John Burt's idea, that it was created at a time where actually production of food was very low, um, seeds were not being fertilized. In fact, it was a time where we were facing poverty rather than richness. And therefore it was thought, let's spend time and effort. And it was a lot of time and effort to build this mound to enhance the energy, obviously understanding the energies of the earth that run beneath Silbury Hill and how to harness that energy, bring it up into this pregnant belly so that it could then be used not only for fertilization of seeds, but also fertilization of people. And we believe that this is still working 4,500 years beyond when it was built. And maybe again, it's telling us something that we need to now recognize that we can't just keep producing food, first of all, that has no connection to the earth, we, but also we need to understand it's not about not having enough, but the seeds themselves are not life, don't carry a life force that is strong enough to support our weakening immune system. And I think that this is what has been understood that many a time around these sites, you would find pits where there would be seeds in there from thousands of years back, um, or at least the evidence of them and understanding that that's what they understood, that when they connected the seeds directly into these really powerful earth energies, and then you had the fertilization occurring through the movement of the water and the movement of the air, you created a much richer source of energy. Maybe we need to return to that. And as I'm listening and watching those who are talking about sustainable energies and looking at wind and sun and everything, think, no, the energy that Tesla knew about, that these people knew about, is beneath our feet. But it can't be owned by one group. It is there for everyone. And I believe that our ancient and our ancestors understood this. And they knew that these energies would be heightened in the morning and die off in the evening. We call it the dragon energy. These dragon or telluric energies are very high in the morning, die off in the evening. They knew they were heightened at times where there was a lot of rain or, or where the water would flow in a different way. 
In places like the Sahara, they would use the wind as a means of understanding that this was a very rich time for fertilizing their seeds. We need to return to these times. We need to understand how to work with nature, not against her. Stealing her energy is not the way to be in a reciprocal and a cooperative way with nature. And I think until we start to be more humble, this will continue to be a problem. So Silbury Hill is wonderful, pregnant belly with energy. And maybe my last thought on this is that I've also been aware that there are places around the world where these sort of mounds are built, sacred mounds, and they are said to be over extraordinarily rich sources of this dragon energy coming up. And that many different temples and stupas and even the pyramids were built to contain this energy and to use it in a certain way. So I feel that it's our understanding of, of how to connect that energy, how to sustain ourselves with it, how to share it. We'll be moving on soon to Avebury itself. Now we move on to Avebury, one of the largest stone circles in the world, built probably about 5,200 years ago and consisting of an outer ring and then two inner rings and two avenues coming in to that ring and made up of many stones some of which have disappeared because there is a village right in the middle of the Avery stone circles and it is clear that many of the stones were broken up and taken for building sites whether it's of the church or the or the houses, or even the pub, which is a great pub in the centre of Avebury. And the understanding of Avebury is that it is there, as you see these stone circles, but around it is a henge, and a henge is a bank and an inner, inner canal or an inner moat. And when you see this, you know that that moat was not built for defences because most defensive mounds or banks have the moat on the outside, the ditch. And that obviously would be a way of protecting. So to build a bank and then put the ditch inside <laughs> was an unusual situation if you were just using this for defence. But you will find that there are many henges around the world and obviously we have the word Stonehenge. So this idea of why did they build a bank and a ditch? And then what was most specific have two entry points pointing north south. And what we now understand again through Don Burke's book, uh, Seeds of Knowledge, is that when you build such a bank and such a ditch, you're literally stopping the flow of telluric energy, earth energy, dragon energy through the land. And you're then focusing it through the two entry points you have. So you're increasing the energy coming through the points where you want it to come, which is very clever. And it just so happens that those two entry points <laughs> are also the points where the road meets another road. So there's a kind of a crossroads at those two points. It's, it's fascinating. And you will also see that where the entrance point is, there are two major stones, guardians, both at the north entrance and the south entrance. And fascinating that you can feel their electromagnetic field their force holding that guardianship saying okay you can allow that energy between us and from that point and you see this on the map is that at from those entry points you have two avenues going out one avenue has disappeared <laughs> because it's been used for building but the other avenue is still there and you can walk along it and what is described is that again as you move between the stones that create this avenue, there is an electromagnetic field again, increasing your own energy or increasing the energy that's running along the avenue. And the way that they maintained the, vo the volume of energy that was coming is apparently they made the stones larger and larger as they got towards the stone circle. Very clever. So 
What does all this mean? If we consider that Silbury Hill was this pregnant mother energy or earth energy, this her energy then flowed down these avenues and increased the energy within the circles. Now, if you ask many people, they say, ah, yes, many fertility rites are carried out there. This is what the Druids would use it for. Many fertility dances, whether it's at the spring or, or again in the harvest time. So it was understood that there was a different energy, different times of the year. But we must also just again consider that maybe this was fertility of seeds in order to plant them again to have a richness of a seed or maybe it was for humans but it may have been for the land itself the idea that you could build a circle and intensify the energy making it so that the energy built up in that place this electromagnetic energy would then spread along or out through the grid of the earth or out through the energy field of of the planet so i wonder if these places were specifically created to impact not only a few people who could gather in those circles but literally send consciousness out into the world and what you'll see is that the circles themselves where the avenues come in it isn't just a straight north south it's as if they're coming in at an angle. And if you've ever seen the Bridget cross, it, it doesn't just cross across, it comes in at an angle. And because of the angle, it creates this force of energy, somewhat like a, 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 a pull-push situation. And so if you imagine that you are pulling on a rope and you're, you've got that rope tied around a center pole, if you just, have two people pulling on either rope it's nothing's going to happen but if you create a little bit of tension where one person let's say is 30 degrees higher one person is 30 degrees lower than the than the horizontal you start to create this sort of churning motion i hope that's making sense and i hope you'll see that in the diagram i'm showing and it reminded me of the churning of the sea of milk and this is a Hindu text or Hindu story that talks about two groups that didn't get on with each other. <laughs> oh, there we go. Do we ever know such a thing before? And they are the Divas and the Azuras. And basically the Divas wanted to become gods and the, they saw the Azuras as the demons. Okay, it's not dissimilar. And they called on Vishnu and said, okay, Vishnu, we want to get we want to receive immortality. We want to become gods. And Vishnu, being a wise soul, said, OK, you can only do that by actually working together with the Azuras, the demons. Of course, they didn't want to do that, but they realized that they were never going to receive immortality unless they worked together. And it wasn't, again, to pull against each other. It was to build this sort of energy as one would pull and the milk of the sea of milk, which is known as the ocean of possibilities, the mother, great mother's ocean of possibilities. Basically, it was only by working together would they receive the riches and the potential that was going to come out of the sea. So they were pulling against the mountain. I think it's Mandara and everything was going well. They were churning this milk until the mountain started to sink into the milk and they called on Vishnu again. And this time he said, OK, I am going to create a turtle underneath the mountain to hold everything up. And they kept pulling and what they're pulling on in this story is a serpent. So that each of them is using energy to, to churn this milk, the serpent representing just pure energy. Well, they keep churning and eventually what happens is they create something that comes out of the milk which initially is poisonous and they ask the gods to come and swallow this poison so they don't get affected. The next thing that appears is what we might call glamour or wonderful things that you could get caught up in. But again, they were told, don't get too caught up in that. And then the third thing that appeared was the elixir of immortality. And the meaning of this story is that we have to work together, not only 
with those that we don't approve of, with those we don't like, but maybe more importantly with those parts of ourselves that we don't like, we don't approve of. And so it's really saying is meeting ourselves and marrying our dark self, our negative self, it is only when we engage and integrate all of those pieces into our hearts will we be able to churn that milk. And the more we churn it, the more we integrate, the more powerful we will become and the more powerful we're going to be able to actually experience higher consciousness, greater consciousness, ascension, might say, some might say. And that the mountain represents pure intention. So you have to have a pure intention. You have to know what you're wanting to do. But if you only work with intention, then eventually the mountain will just sink back into the place of illusion. Because you have to do the inner work, which is the turtle. If we don't do our inner work, if we don't take that ownership, so it's not all about action, it's about owning what we have learned from our actions that makes us stronger. And initially we meet all the poisons that come out of this sea, which is some of the energy that we've created that we don't want to own. So we have to own our own creations and we have to swallow that which we've created. And then we mustn't get caught up in the glamour, thinking that, oh, look at how wonderful I am. And that's a message I hear many times. Be careful, because as we go towards spiritual enlightenment, we also have to face the glamour of it. And then the third part is that once we do that, we create this immortality. And that immortality is, is becoming clear of any density that might keep us having to if I may say, return back onto earth. But once we reach that place of immortality, it's not about not being on earth, it's realizing that earth doesn't exist, or that a limited life doesn't exist. That's what immortality is. So I leave you with that thought. I love Avebury, and I just felt it was important to see that maybe we were being taught this message, not just to build energy, but to use it wisely in the way in which I've described. We'll be moving on to the Long Barrow. The last place we visited was West Kennet Long Barrow. Long Barrow is a structure that has an entrance point. This one has five chambers inside it, four at the side and one at the back. But what's interesting is that those chambers only actually cover about a fifth of the length of this Long Barrow. The rest are stones, made up of stones. And the whole length is about 100 metres. It has an east-west alignment. And the entrance point is covered by some very large stones. So you have to kind of walk around them to get into the chamber itself. Some say that those large stones were there to stop people moving in. But I think it actually holds the energy in much more importantly. That's what I've seen in other dolmens and barrows that you're actually sealing the chamber to keep the magnetic electrical energy inside. When you enter in, you see those four chambers to the side and one of them has a large dish inside, very similar to New Grange. But each of the chambers has been built with sarsen stones or different stones that build up in a cobbled way. In other words, they narrow up towards the top which again is a beehive effect, increasing the energy in each of those chambers. The large stones inside the barrow are sarsen stones, which are silica based. Silica is like in a computer, like in a watch. It holds energy, it stores energy and accelerates or expands energy. So all of this tells me this barrow was not built, as many talk about, for a burial of the dead. It is a place where you expand consciousness. You talk to the bed, dead, where the spirits can meet you. And that's what I found. So as we walked in, there was this resonance, this feeling you experienced. And my friend and I toned as deeply as we can, because we know that the male voice toning seems to expand that consciousness in this place more than the higher pitches of a female. And so we toned very deeply and continued to tone and we experienced overtones when we were doing this. We actually leant our foreheads against the stone itself. 
and what I experienced was beings coming out from the stones to meet us. We were doing this in love and light and what we experienced was beings of light who were saying, oh, thanks for coming. This is really nice to see you. And so it felt like our toning was inviting those beings to come out. Now, whether this was beings within the stone, because stones hold spirits themselves, or that beings of light or spirits who had passed over were using this as a doorway, I don't know. We didn't get too long in there. People were coming and going, but long enough for me to realize that despite the fact they found people buried there, I think about 36 different corpses there, this was not the purpose of this barrow. It was literally a place of ritual, of portaling towards and be between the worlds. And to me, the, the length of it that is not actually chambered, as we might say, is to enhance the portal's energy, the stones used in the four-fifths of the barrow, which are much longer, were used to actually enhance the energy. So this is a very magical place to go to, and I always love going there. We were fortunate to be there just before the sunset, so we experienced that westerly sun just dipping away into behind the horizon and from the place of the long barrow you can see silbury hill you can look across to avebury you look across to the sanctuary to windmill hill it really is a wonderful place to see everything so thank you for journeying with me i hope you will perhaps think of joining me on earth mysteries buying a visa or maybe just journeying onto one of the videos there on my store please go to christinepage.com but otherwise, I wish you a good week and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye now. Thanks for listening to the HeartSpeak Podcast with Dr. Christine Page. Please check out all HeartSpeak episodes in the podcast archive section on www.christinepage.com. HeartSpeak is also available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, and now playing on Amazon Music and iHeartRadio. You can also watch the Archive Podcast on Christine's channel, on YouTube, and now on Rumble. Connect with Christine on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook, including her newest Facebook group, The Great Mother Calling. Do share with family, friends, colleagues. Join us next time for another edition of HeartSpeak.